about a decade ago at uh, Wheel and Ends Associates Manitoba Wildlands. So uh, we worked together uh, working with uh, on, a, on a number of issues. So I know Jessica well and uh, excited to have her here. Jessica is the general manager at Mother Earth Recycling. That's an Indigenous for-profit social enterprise. She's going to talk to us about that today. So I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I'll let you know that she is herself a proud member of the Métis Nation. Jessica has been working with urban and Indigenous communities and rural First Nations for the past 13 years on environmental sustainability, social responsibility, land use, and self-governance. She's, she's a graduate from the University of Manitoba in environmental conservation. She's currently a director on both the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce and the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. She also is a regular guest lecturer at the University of Manitoba and the University of Winnipeg, where she talks about corporate social responsibility and why businesses need to focus on social and environmental issues. So we're really lucky to have her here. And uh, Jessica, you know, in exchange for you sharing your knowledge today, we really do appreciate it. I have a, a bundle appropriately of Mother Earth tobacco from Long Plain First Nation here. And so I'm virtually going to be handing this over to you here right now. And uh, I will drop it by your place later today. So thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for sharing your knowledge today. And I will turn the floor over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, James. Uh, thank you for having me today here and uh, letting me speak to everybody about what Mother Earth is and what we do. I am going to share uh, a presentation now with you guys. Um, like James said, feel free to uh, make messages in the chat. I'm just gonna get that open so I can see it. If anybody has questions, I will try to answer them as we go along. And then uh, I'm sure we will have a lot of time afterwards because I'm not gonna speak for too, too long. So Mother Earth Recycling is an indigenous for-profit work integration, social enterprise and environmental organization. Our mission is to provide meaningful training and employment opportunities to the urban indigenous community through environmentally sustainable initiatives. We operate as a triple bottom line organization. Everything that we do from starting new business lines, hiring and training programs to general day-to-day -day decision makings, all have to hit these three measures in order for us to move forward. For our social responsibility, our duty to act in the best interest of our staff and community, for environmental sustainability, to ensure that we interact with the natural world in a positive way, avoiding jeopardizing future generations' natural resources, and economic prosperity to positively increase the economic growth of the business. None of these can be done independently, and we need to create a balance to grow all pillars of the organization together. Mother Earth Recycling began in 2012 as a partnership between Negan and Center the Centre for Aboriginal Human Resource Development, or CARD, as we refer to it, and the Aboriginal Council of Winnipeg. It was created as a place for community members to find training and job opportunities while providing much needed services to the city. In 2015, Mother Earth Recycling partnered with the province of Manitoba to operate a two-year pilot project to expand operations from solely e-waste recycling and refurbishment into mattress and box spring recycling. Now in 2021, Mother Earth Recycling has begun to look at future of the organization and is again looking into expansion, both in the types and locations of services. As a work integration social enterprise, we train and hire individuals with multiple barriers. Our focus is on Indigenous youth and women who have a lack of job experience and education. We have also created a workplace that allows for individuals to feel supported and access resources to help them along their journey. As a part of the training program, the trainees go through two weeks of in-class training to getting certificates in any and all training that we can fit in. For example, they get their food handler certificate, which they clearly don't need at a recycling facility, uh, but they can utilize that after they leave Mother Earth Recycling and apply for other jobs. We also do job specific training like skid steer, forklift and first aid, as well as personal finance, building healthy relationships, and sometimes even parenting classes as well. We have 10 to 20 trainees come through our program each year, and we see a lot of different situations. We have some people coming out of incarceration or having a long criminal record that has prevented them from getting a job. We have individuals going through drug and alcohol treatment programs, parents working to get their children out of CFS care, and we see a lot and lots of trauma. Our trainees and staff are encouraged and supported in finding counseling and peer support groups in the community to help them in recovery 
and they're also provided time to have regular counseling and attend cultural events such as sweats, powwows, sundance ceremonies, and medicine picking. So Mother Earth Recycling is a 100% indigenously owned, operated, and staffed business. Our shareholders, board members, management, and staff are all First Nation or Métis. We're very aware of the fact that we are one of the few Indigenous businesses in Winnipeg and that we are well known throughout the city and the province as an Indigenous business, which comes with a fair amount of responsibility. I'm often asked, um, partly as I was today, to speak on behalf of Indigenous people and businesses. As I am a Métis, proud member of the Métis urban community in Winnipeg, I'm not always comfortable saying that I'm speaking on behalf of Indigenous people or businesses. I was not raised in this community and I was not raised with any influence from Indigenous culture. And I was not therefore subjected to the same systemic and cultural barriers that many Indigenous people face and still face today. I'm still learning about my Métis culture and will forever be learning from those around me because of not growing up with these influences. I am, however, a huge ally to the community and will happily lend my voice when it's appropriate to make sure that I bring light to the phenomenal work that's being done in the community. Indigenous people have long been segregated and persecuted and removed from participating in economic prosperity. There is no generational wealth within the Indigenous community and the majority of Indigenous people struggle to buy homes, are living paycheck to paycheck and are accessing food banks and income assistance. The Indigenous population in our city has the highest unemployment rate as well. We also have a part to play in the economic reconciliation dialogue, addressing challenges and growing the Indigenous economy. We are helping to build local relationships with Indigenous people to support Indigenous economies in order to achieve sustainable, effective and inclusive local economic development. Indigenous business is not only about doing business within the Indigenous community, it's also about bringing Indigenous people, ideas, traditions, and products into the mainstream markets. At Mother Earth Recycling, our goal is to create jobs that will allow our people to grow and succeed in the workforce, provide for their families, independent of government assistance, and build strong and healthy communities with economic impact. Creating opportunities through employment and providing supports to staff and trainees, Mother Earth Recycling is actively working to foster a workplace of understanding and empathy that allows for everyone, regardless of their barriers they face, to grow and thrive. Mother Earth Recycling is also an environmental organization and feels that we have a unique worldview through economic development and resource management due to the Indigenous perspectives we carry. Embedded within traditional Indigenous worldviews is the concept of collective responsibility to respect and maintain the natural environment and use only what we need for sustenance. While we work with modern technologies, it's our commitment to environmental sustainability allows employees to reconnect with an integral part of their culture. So now really to the meat of what we do. So we are a work integration social enterprise. We are an indigenous business, but at the end of the day, what we do day to day is recycling and refurbishment. So I'll go through a little bit of the history of recycling and then a bit into the exact types of recycling we do, and then the future of what we're looking at as a business. So firstly, I'll hit on producer responsibility organizations. These are provincially regulated programs that charge environmental levies at the time of purchase on specific products to cover the costs associated with recycling at the product's end of life. In Manitoba, we have 12 producer responsibility organizations that operate depots throughout the province. Mother Earth Recycling acts as a collection depot for e-waste, batteries, and light bulbs. Mattresses and other furnitures do not have a producer responsibility organization, and therefore we need to collect a levy at the end of life when people bring those items in for recycling. Mother Earth Recycling collects electronics through the Manitoba's Recycle My Electronics program, previously known as EPRA. Mother Earth Recycling accepts any electronics that are damaged, undesired, or old when people Oh, I messed up everything. Uh, we also refurbish and sell items in our retail store. There's a long list of detailed items that you can find. Some are listed here, but there's also on the Recycle My Electronics website. Uh, but essentially, we will take anything that plugs in or runs on batteries. We also offer data security to our customers. Larger clients and some individuals want to have their items refurbished or recycled, knowing that their data will not be stumbled upon by somebody. Um, and let out into the broader community. So we have a shredder, there's a picture of it there, that big old blue machine that says feed me. 
Um, it's very high tech. Uh, <laughs> so we essentially uh, shred all hard drives that come in to our facility. Our larger customers that have tens or hundreds of hard drives, we actually scan every hard drive and create a catalog of every item that they send us. We video the destruction and then send that list video and a certificate of destruction back to them so they can have peace of mind knowing their data is safe. At Mother Earth Recycling, we believe that access to technology is no longer a luxury, but a necessity. This technology allows individuals to post jobs, to write resumes, do research, homework for school, and so much more. We provide high quality refurbished computers with hardware warranties for a very reasonable price to the community. These practices allow low-income families and small businesses to succeed. Our store is open to the public weekdays from 8.30 to 4.30, and we also offer repair services. We do not charge customers to look at their items, unlike most repair stores, and we also refurbish, or sorry, we also repair using refurbished parts when possible, which reduces the cost to the customer. So mattress recycling, which is by far our largest division of recycling now, all mattresses and box springs sent to Mother Earth Recycling for processing get separated into four primary materials, which are fabric, foam, metal, and wood. No mattress ever leaves our facility as a mattress. Once it comes into our facility, it is taken apart. It does not get to leave as a mattress ever again. We get a lot of people reaching out asking if we can donate mattresses or if they can buy one off of them. Um, and that is not something that we will ever do. Everything gets recycled. A pro and, and to add to that, there are a lot of organizations in our community doing really great work on refurbishing mattresses that are clean enough to do that, um, which we will talk about in a few minutes when I play a video. So approximately 95% of these materials, the fabric foam, metal, and wood are recycled. This process keeps hundreds of tons of bulky waste out of our landfills and creates a market for recycled materials in the community and creates jobs. Due to mattresses and box springs not having a producer responsibility organization and the levies at the time of purchase, we have to charge a fee at the end of life uh, when the items are dropped off. We charge $15 per unit. So if you bring a mattress and a box spring, it's $30. If you bring us 100 mattresses, it's still $15 a unit. It doesn't matter the volume that comes in. Mattress recycling is a pretty labor intensive process, which is great for us because we want to create these jobs. Mattresses get sent to us from all across Southern Manitoba and they're unloaded by hand. Some days we get 20 to 40 units, other days we get 400 units. So it really varies, uh, but we almost always have a backlog of units. Um, we just expanded our facility to 7,000 more square feet, and it is still completely full of mattresses, as is our compound outside. So we're never short on stuff for our staff to do. Our staff each process approximately four units an hour, and we currently run six tables at a time, so six people taking apart mattresses. Plus, we have someone moving the materials in the warehouse, another person in shipping and receiving, and another person bailing materials. So at our busiest times, we have between nine and 15 people on mattresses a day. We recently had a video about mattress recycling made for us. It's uh, three and a half minutes long and I'll play it for you now. Um, hopefully this works. If, uh, if anybody can't hear it, just comment and I will uh, make sure that it's working. Mattresses take 80 to 120 years to break down. You need to be responsible for it for its entire life cycle, not just the 10 years that you had it, but that additional 120 years that is going to sit in the landfill. The mattress recycling process is a partnership with retailers, rural municipalities, government offices, really anybody that uses a mattress, so general public as well. They bring mattresses to us or collect at their landfills or their stores. And then we take them apart using hand tools, creating jobs for people who would otherwise go without work. So we have four tables running at any time with our staff taking mattresses apart. Everything is done by hand. The foam we cut out of every mattress, we bale it and we ship it to Madison, Wisconsin. It gets entirely recycled down there. They break it back down into a base form of plastic and they use it to make new plastic materials. The wood stays within Winnipeg. It actually gets sent out to a lumberyard and they get made into biofuel. We're really lucky that we have a foundry just outside the city. So all of our metal goes to the foundry locally, gets melted down and gets remade into different metal products here in Winnipeg.
Anybody can drop off a mattress at our location at 771 Main Street. If you're within Winnipeg, you can also take it to the Brady Road for our depot and the city of Winnipeg then pays to recycle it. And as well, we have retailers that work with us. So for example, Ikea, if you buy a mattress at Ikea and they come and drop off your new mattress, they'll take your old mattress away and recycle it with us. We also have partnerships with uh, different municipalities. So depending where you live outside the city, your landfill may take it. So if you live in rural Manitoba and you go to take your mattress in to be recycled at your local landfill and they don't have a partnership with us, let them know that you would like to see this where you live and we will work with them to set it up and get everybody started. So we don't want mattresses that are still usable, still good. There's a lot of organizations in our city that can take good, clean mattresses and give them to people that need them. We're taking the stuff that's ending up at the landfill. In the last year, we got 20,000 mattresses dropped off for recycling. However, we do know that 30 to 35,000 mattresses a year go into the landfill in Winnipeg alone. So that's the volume of the Manitoba Hydro Building on Portage Avenue. If on January 1st you started filling that up with those mattresses instead of going to the landfill, the entire building would be full top to bottom by the end of the year. So it's a massive volume uh, that's going into our landfill that 95% of which can be diverted and recycled and create jobs. Not everybody needs to throw out their mattress tomorrow, but when someone eventually does need to throw out their mattress, we want them to remember we are the ones to do that with. We have the capacity to double, if not triple, how many we're processing here at our facility, so we still have a long way to go. We still have lots more mattresses to pull out, we have lots more municipalities to work with, a lot more government to get on board with what we're doing and why we're doing it, and we have a lot more jobs to create by doing that. So that was a nice little summary about uh, our organization and what we do. I also really love that video. He did some phenomenal work getting uh, video footage that really shows the day-to-day -day operations and how much work goes into taking all those units apart. Um, and that's a fairly new video and there's already changes. So like I said, in the video, it says we're running four tables. We're running six now because we're so busy. And even that list of landfills uh, that he opted that uh, got put up there when the province of Manitoba was shown. That list has grown even since making this video a few months ago. So we're constantly growing and expanding. So some other recycling. Uh, throughout the years, we've added little recycling programs here and there. So as I mentioned previously, we act as a depot for other recyclable items, such as light bulbs and batteries. Uh, we also accept any appliances and scrap metal. Um, unlike scrapyards that pay for these items, we just accept them as recyclable items and we take them to the scrapyards ourselves and pull out as much electronic parts as possible. We also get some other uh, kind of weird items as requested. Uh, so in that picture there, you can see those bottles of protein powder. Uh, we had somebody one time that had 30,000 bottles of protein powder um, and they needed to get rid of them um, for some kind of lawsuit or something. I, I honestly can't remember. It was quite a few years ago now. Um, but we took 30,000 bottles of protein powder and we opened up each bottle. We dumped out the powder. All the powder went to the compost yard because it was still safe and it was compostable. And then we managed to recycle the plastic bottles, tubs and lids, lids all separately. Um, and it was a really good project to keep our staff busy through a really long, <laughs> um, empty winter when we first got started with the mattress project. Uh, you can also see there these blue squares. Those were from a university. They were stools from one of the lounges. Uh, if you drive around the Point Douglas area, you might see some now in people's yards using being used as raised garden beds. Um, and then this weird metal thing in the corner there, that's actually a skate ramp uh, for skateboarding. A uh, community center in the city upgraded their skate park and they wanted to make sure that the ramps that were still good went to somebody that needed them. So we found another community center in the neighborhood that could use them. So we get these things from time to time that uh, we do. We get tanning beds brought in, just weird things that don't fit within a recycling program. But we tell everybody that if you have something that's weird and different and it doesn't fit into a regular recycling program, to just call and let us know and uh, we'll do our best to find something uh, for it to fit into. So the future of recycling. 
Mother Earth Recycling has been working on multiple feasibility studies and product and product test process testing to determine what the next lines of recycling will be. Uh, we've also been looking at what other areas in Canada would benefit from having this model in their city, and we're looking for partners to make this happen. So I'll go into a little detail about some of the other materials that we've been looking into. Um, some of these are items that would act as a depot that are covered under producer responsibility organizations and others are new materials that are not being recycled here or really anywhere in Canada. Um, I'd also like to stress that we are not accepting any of these items yet. Hopefully one day we will and we will make an announcement at that time, um, but definitely do not show up with any of these items yet because we are not properly set up to accept them at this time. So these are feasibility studies that we've been working on. So looking at paint and aerosol recycling, this would be part of a stewardship plan. Um, so we would act as a depot for these kind of items. Uh, but we, for the paint and aerosols, we would be looking at uh, more commercial volumes. So you can take your paint and things to the Winnipeg for our depots for residential drop-offs and residential volumes. Uh, but we would be looking more at partnering with uh, contractors and construction workers that have a lot um, industrial volumes that we could work with. So ozone depleting substances, this is your fridges, freezers, air conditioners, and water coolers. Uh, this is also a really great opportunity to train more people on another skill and a certificate. So we see this as um, when hitting on all those different things, this hits economically by creating money, it hits uh, socially by creating these jobs and certificates, and obviously environmentally by getting these ozone depleting substances out of the landfills. So I saw James in the comments asked about furniture. So there's a big X over this furniture. Uh, we did do a feasibility study. Um, and right now, this is not something that we're going to be moving forward with. We were really hoping that it could work. Um, but just the sheer volume and size of furniture and the variability between different couches, different chairs, different love seats, like we did the product testing on this and it was unbelievably expensive and bulky to do this it would essentially need an entirely new operation um so until we can find some sort of maybe pilot project through the province or the city um it's just not feasible for us to do as a for-profit independent organization um, it would need a whole new facility a whole new set of staff um, and the price to the consumer because it would not have that levy at the time of purchase we would have to charge at the end of the life it would be really high even compared to the mattresses so the one i'm really excited about and hoping that we can make it to the operational stage on is car seat recycling because really it's not being done anywhere um, and all car seats have expiration dates. You're not supposed to reuse them. You're not supposed to share them. You can't use them past that expiration date uh, due to the degradation of the plastic being in cars. So the heat versus cold in our winters can really degrade that plastic and make them unsafe. And if anybody has children, you know you go through that bucket stage and then the booster seat and then the, uh, there's so many stages of car seats and there's some in each person's car and then the grandparents' car. So there ends up being a lot of car seats out in the community that can be recycled. Um, however, it links primarily to the plastic recycling. That's really the bulk of what is in a car seat. So this is gonna take us a while to get going. This is what I really, 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 really wanna do one day and that's plastic recycling. So as you can see in this picture here, it's the three stages. So the shredding, the melting and the reforming into new products. I really encourage everybody out there to check out preciousplastics.com. It's a wonderful, I don't even want to call them an organization, um, but it's out of uh, the UK somewhere and it's free information. You can go onto this site and download the specs to build all these machines to do this operation. And there's people throughout all of Europe, Asia, Africa doing this work. And I think there's even a couple in the US um, but there's really nobody in Canada that's doing this and making really cool, neat products out of these plastics. So these are a couple of the examples um, of what they're making. So furniture, tiles, these building block type things, um, all sorts of stuff. I'm really hoping that we can get into some kind of reforming. And because we would be working primarily with black plastic from car seats, I'm hoping to make something like plant pots 
or potentially backsplash tiles one day. So it ends up creating new items that we can sell. It's 100% recycled material. And as always, it creates more jobs. So I'm really hoping one day to see that take off. But again, that future recycling isn't here yet. So please don't bring us those things. Um, and we will make sure to make it very public uh, once we are able to do that. So this is my information and our store information. Um, you can also go to our website, MotherEarthRecycling.ca and you can contact us through there. And I will stop sharing my screen now. Oh, thank you, James. He shared our website there. And I'll stop sharing. There we go. So if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I know we had two hours to talk and I'd only talked for half an hour, so. I'll, I'll kick it off. It was actually Angela who shared the link. So Angela, oh, thank you, Angela. Those your questions. I just had a couple questions for you to follow up on maybe is you mentioned that there's not a levy. So obviously having some extended producer responsibility and laws would seemingly help a business like yours. So one of my questions is what else, what other legislative and maybe even to a certain extent policy barriers are there for you? So I mean, I heard I don't want to, you know, I heard extended producer responsibility, but I would think even in terms of looking at our Corporations Act or our Cooperatives Act in terms of what social enterprises need to be more flexible, I guess for you as a social enterprise, what are the needs in terms of changes that might make uh, businesses like yours more viable or what barriers do you face where there could be changes in law and or policy? that could help that way. And I have a secondary question from that, but I'll just start on that one. Sure. Um, so we are working with uh, different levels of government to see how we can improve recycling and social enterprises in the community. Um, the city of Winnipeg is working on a social procurement policy right now uh, for purchasing at the city. Um, I believe the province is working on that too. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but really just making it easier for government to partner with social enterprises, not just Mother Earth Recycling, but any organization. Um, we have so many great social enterprises in our city. So uh, right next door to us is Build and Purpose Construction and they do phenomenal construction work, but there's contracts that are just too big for them to be able to bid on. So if the city and the province would allow um, breaking up those contracts and having social enterprises bid on smaller chunks of those uh, would be really beneficial. Um, and then for specifically for mattress recycling, um, I'm still not sure <laughs> if we want to see a levy put in place uh, and have a producer responsibility organization uh, set up. Um, I definitely think it would be a good move in some ways. There's also other options of things like landfill bans on mattresses. But anytime you set up something like that, you also open up the door to then people dumping mattresses. And we already know that that's a problem in our city. Um, the city itself spends almost $500,000 a year on arsons caused by mattresses being left in back lanes. So we also don't want to set up more barriers to people being able to get rid of items. Um, so I'm not sure what the perfect answer is, but there's lots of options out there and there's lots of discussions that we're still having with uh, different levels of government on how we can make this a little bit of a smoother process um, and also being able to collect more. Like I said in the video, there's 35,000 mattresses a year in Winnipeg going into the landfill alone and we're only capturing a small percentage of that. So we're hoping to see that continue to grow and be able to collect more. Do you think there's certain advantages in the perspective, like I think one of the important, maybe not important, but Mother Earth Recycling runs as a for-profit enterprise versus mm -hmm. running as like you mentioned, say an extended producer responsibility organization or something that was set up as a non-for-profit and was heavily reliant on either government subsidies or, or a fee and levy system or some sort of set like that. Do you think that changes the perspective of the organization and do you think there's advantages and, and or disadvantages to that and what would those be? Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that. Like 
we're set up as a for-profit organization. The primary reason for that was that we didn't want to be, and we still don't want to be reliant on funding. We do get funding when it's available, but it's not something that we intentionally, we don't go out looking for funding. Um, when there's funding prog programs that are announced and they seem like they fit with what we do and it can fit within um, our timeline really of what we want to do, then we will apply for it. Um, the variability of being a not-for-profit and trying to operate an organization like this and have the staffing that we have. Um, I, I can't imagine running that kind of organization, but that being said, I've also never ran a nonprofit organization. So they, there might be benefits uh, to both sides of doing that. I just know that we are doing really well. Um, the past year and a half, um, I know has been a hard on a lot of organizations and a lot of people because of COVID, but it's actually been our best year and a half ever. Um, we're busier than we've ever been. We are seeing growth stronger than we ever have before. Um, and I take a lot of pride in the fact that we've managed to do that as a fee-for-service business and not relying on government funding um, to be able to operate our core business. So yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that, James. Don't be shy, people. Others can uh, chime in. <laughs> I asked you some tough ones, Jessica. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. <laughs> I like tough questions. Just it—it it is a Saturday morning, and I slept in. So, and I'll also say too that if anybody ever wants to come see our facility, we are a very open and transparent organization. And that's why I really wanted to make that video about mattress recycling as well. Um, when the mattress recycling program uh, got announced with the city of Winnipeg that they were partnering with us, they put out social media posts about it. And I, of course, was on every single one of them <laughs> commenting and uh, explaining the program. And a lot of people don't trust those kind of programs and would say, oh, like they're just going to put them in a pile. And then at the end of the day, they're just dumping them in the landfill anyways. And they just don't believe that the work is being done. So I really liked having that video made that very clearly shows what we do and shows the breakdown that we're doing. Um, so and if anybody ever wants to stop by, we're very happy to do that. I, uh, I, I've never heard of you guys before. So where are you located? I'd oh, like yeah. to drop by. Perfect. Uh, we're at 771 Main Street in Winnipeg. So mm -hmm. if you're heading north out of downtown on Main Street and you go under the Higgins underpass, mm -hmm. we're right on the right hand side. So by the time you're up over that underpass, you've almost passed us already. It's a okay. weird little location. I encourage everybody to Google map where we are before mm -hmm. you come to us because it is a strange location you essentially have to go down sutherland down austin down a back lane and back to main streets to get to where we are okay and yeah. and what are your hours we're monday to friday 8 30 to 4 30 okay thanks <clears throat> no problem i have a quick question yeah um if I was to come to the store, what are the general retail prices like if we're looking for, say, an easy laptop to start or something, like you said, for easy resumes and quick computer access? Do you have a PC available on shelf? And how much would that range from? So most of our desktop computers start at around $100. Um, that's for the tower monitor keyboard and mouse. And it comes fully loaded with Microsoft Word, all that kind of stuff on there. Our laptops are a little bit more expensive, um, kind of depending on the quality of items that we get. Um, they usually start around $200 to $250 for the laptops. Um, the unfortunate part is that it really is at the whim of what gets dropped off. So residential drop-offs uh, all generally go for recycling. They don't go for refurbishment. Refurbishment is partnerships that we have with larger organizations in the city where when they recycle items, they don't just get one or two new computers and send us the old ones. They're doing a full sweep of their organization and they're getting like a hundred new computers at their business. So they're sending us pallets full of those materials. And that's when we do that data security as well for them and the shredding of their hard drives. Um, so those are more the units that we see going into the store. So before COVID, 
we were getting a ton of electronics brought in for recycling and refurbishment. Uh, since COVID has started, we've really seen a decline in the amount of materials that are coming in for recycling and primarily for refurbishment. And I think that's because of COVID, a lot of people have gone to working from home. So those work, the offices aren't upgrading the materials as often. So we're just seeing a little bit of decline there. I have a follow-up question. Yeah. So then if you have a storage full of computers missing hard drives because they've been crushed, where do you refill all your hard drives from? Uh, so sometimes we just go buy new hard drives from places like Memory Express or something like that or online. Um, but we do have organizations that will allow us just to wipe their hard drive. So we use the national defense standard for wiping hard drives. It's a seven pass system. So essentially we wipe their hard drive seven times. Um, and we do that quite often with partners, but it's definitely something that we get permission from the original owners of the computers first before we do that. Um, and then we're allowed to reuse those hard drives. And we've been doing this for almost 10 years now and nobody's data has, there's never been financial information get out there or pictures get out there. No one's ever had information come up from this kind of thing. I see there's a comment here. Do the municipalities use those actually also accept electronics? Um, so for the municipalities that we partner with, we partner with them just for the mattress program. Most municipalities throughout the province uh, already partner with EPRA or the Recycle My Electronics program as it's called now and send directly to them. So we only act as a depot. We don't go out and collect electronics from municipalities. We just do um, essentially drop off in businesses within the city of Winnipeg. Could you comment on the importance of labor? Like, I mean, I might come to the social enterprise, but I'm thinking wiping a computer memory seven times takes a lot of work. Um, even you showed all the work on the mattress and obviously part of the issue with the furniture, as you said, each couch is unique. So even though it's wood, metal and, and foam, you know, there's a lot of labor and work at that, I presume, as part of it. So I, I wonder if that's something you could comment on, too, because I think that there's that is obviously part of our disposable society and culture that's at, at the root of part of these problems. Yeah. So like I said, Mother's Recycling was started as a, as a movement to create labor, to create jobs. Um, and we also have to hit those three pillars, those social, environmental, and economic. So when looking at something like the furniture recycling, there is a lot of potential there. There is a lot of furniture going into the landfill. It's made up of those same basic components as mattresses. So it makes sense that we'd be able to recycle them the same way, but they need to hit those three pillars. So it hits environmentally, it hits socially, but it doesn't hit economically. The amount that we would have to charge for those uh, for couches and things like that because they are so big and so much more complex than a mattress which is just a big square um, they take up more room it's more time we would have to charge probably minimum $80 a unit um, and we're seeing people that don't want to pay the 15 for mattresses so trying to give people to pay $80 for a couch is just something that we don't think is feasible right now so that's why I said, unless we can come up with some kind of pilot project that is funded, uh, it just doesn't look like something that's going to make sense right now, which is unfortunate because it does create a lot of jobs. Um, but the other lines of recycling that we're looking at create jobs as well. It might not be as many, but there's still jobs that require skills and training and even certifica certification um, in some of them. Um, but those ones make more sense because they hit all three pillars, whereas the furniture just doesn't right now. Thank you for sharing our Instagram link there as well. We're on Instagram and Facebook, and we also have a Twitter account. I had a summer student this summer that was creating content for it and posting and liking and sharing, um, and she has gone back to school. So I will say our, our posting has uh, decreased, and I still don't know how to use Twitter properly. I'm still trying to learn that one, but definitely um, if there's ever any announcements about new materials that we will be accepting, they will be put up on our social media. And I am really, again, it might not happen. I'm really hoping though 
that uh, for waste reduction week this month that we can make some kind of announcement, but I can't guarantee anything at, uh, at this moment. What, what, sorry to keep asking questions, but I just I enjoy that. No, nobody uh, else is, so go nuts. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I was just thinking, what other what other products? Uh, uh, like you, you did go over some of. Um, I lost my question. I'm sorry. Someone else. Should play. I, I had it, and then I lost my train <laughs> of thought. Not enough coffee myself this morning. Uh, there was something fine. I was going to ask you. Oh, it was just. Um, I, I, oh, I was on local on how, like, in terms of your environmental, like, I noticed you, the foam goes to Wisconsin, so I, and you're able to, at least you mentioned the local founders, is that something you guys are also looking at, too, trying to keep stuff local? Like, to me, it, yeah. I did look at the Make It Precious, that's kind of interesting. I've, I've often dreamed, we don't have the money either, the Green Party of Manitoba, uh, getting something like a Make It Precious to do our signs. So we could tell people to pick up all the green, like seven up plastic bottles, et cetera. If you collected those and those became our lawn signs, it'd be kind of cool, but yeah. still questionable on it, I guess. But I just curious about, yeah, like how you guys uh, address dealing local and maybe sometimes the compromise of, you know, although you want to do that, that may not be the best option that meets all three pillars of your business model. Yeah, for sure. So the foam was a hard one. So we love Winnipeg. We love our city. Unfortunately, we don't have a ton of options for reuse and remanufacturing of recycled products here. Before COVID, we were sending our foam to Calgary and it was going to a company there that was turning it into um, to carpet underlay. Uh, and that was an okay relationship. Um, it was hit or miss when they could take the materials because the demand obviously dictated when we could send materials and then at the start of covid they shut down accepting recycled materials uh, for their process so we had to go find someone new so we used a broker out of toronto and he helped us find this organization in madison wisconsin and they are very eager to take our materials and are actually contacting us to see if we have more which is a nice change of pace from us having to hunt down someone to take it um, financially, it does make sense to send it down there. Uh, they pay us per pound. Um, we didn't want to get into the process of shipping out of Canada. Um, Calgary was even far for us, but unfortunately, there just there isn't anywhere else that's doing this kind of work. We did look into purchasing the capital to be able to create materials out of the foam and recycle recycle the foam. Uh, but that would be upwards of a million plus dollars. And we just don't have that kind of money uh, to be able to run that kind of organization. So like you said, there are compromises that we have to make. Um, and for us, that was worth it. There are also places that we can ship the fabric to that could be recycled. Um, but unfortunately, that just is not feasible right now due to how far it is. Um, so environmentally, it just doesn't make sense for the benefits that we would see out of being able to recycle the very, because fabric is only about three to 4% of a mattress. Um, so the amount that it would cost to ship and the environmental impacts of shipping that far just don't make that make sense. So right now, our fabric does go back to the landfill. Uh, we bale all of our fabric first, so it goes back nice and tight into the landfill. It's not blowing around everywhere and wreaking havoc on machines and things like that. Um, it's about 4% of the total volume coming out of our recycling process. Um, and where we're sending it to to be uh, landfilled, uh, they're actually using it to support the walls when they build new cells in their landfill. So it's at least coming in somewhat handy in their landfill process. But yeah, we, are, we definitely want to see things stay as local as possible. Uh, that's why we think having these programs that we're looking at setting up like the car seat and the plastic recycling would be really beneficial because it's something that we can 100% keep local within our city. We wouldn't need to find someone else to be taking the materials outside of Winnipeg. And as well, if we always say, if there's anybody out there that has good ideas, by all means, <laughs> contact us and let us know. We don't know everything. We don't have all the information and we don't have all the ideas. We need uh, participation from everybody to help us succeed.
Come on, James, you have to have more questions for me than that. I'm trying to let others jump in here. Come <laughs> on, people. There's a lot, you know, uh, feel free to ask different questions. I mean, there, there's, yes, there's certainly more questions I could ask. I could keep going, but uh, my big one was the batteries. Like you said, you're sending the batteries out, right? Um, this is more like a side product of vitamin we can connect, but, and it's it's been stalled as I've been starting a business as a side project, but I've been trying to work on a 1946 uh, Chevrolet style master conversion to all electric. Been trying to find a source of reused batteries, which is easier said than done, especially getting lithium across the border. So there are some people in California that are taking old laptop batteries and running electric vehicles on it and wiring them up. We have said, there's it goes really that... technical, it's probably way beyond it, but it's one of my dream projects. And is that something that like, is there a lot of batteries? I think you were sending, you said you were just collecting them and sending them out, but where is that? How would someone access that if they did want to build also like on off-grid solar and, and other projects like that? I could see those ba batteries having a, potential use but i guess oh, it's a question sure. of whether that could be done and whether that would be viable or if you've looked into that yeah i know um we get requests like that all the time uh for different parts and batteries and things like that uh jeff who runs our store and is our it manager um if you just give him a heads up of what you're looking for and what you want he will watch for it and he will pull it out i know we do have someone that is doing something along the similar lines that you're asking about james with laptop batteries um and we store them up and when we have a pallet full he comes and buys them from us um and he's turning them i i don't pretend to know technology <laughs> um, i have an it manager at work and i married someone that is in the it world so i don't have to know those things um but i know that he is doing something along turning them into some kind of electric vehicle process i'm not going to pretend that i know what that is um but that goes for anything, any kind of rare computer parts. We have a lot of people in the city that like to build computers from scratch. Uh, so they call up Jeff and they say, you know, I'm looking for part X, Y, Z. And Jeff writes that down. And the second it comes in, he gives them a call and they come down and pick it up. We also have a lot of local people that just know who we are and what we do. And we have our regulars that stop by on a weekly basis and just rummage around and see what's come in. Um, and they pull out what uh, they think can be reused rather than it being shredded and recycled. So. Um, if anybody's looking for parts, we have a whole wall that's just cords. So any kind of cord you can imagine. Um, if your laptop cord breaks, once for your TV, I don't know, there's just, we have hundreds of thousands of different kinds of cords all labeled and stored. So Jeff can find them easily for people. So I definitely encourage you, James, to get a hold of uh, my IT guy. I'll send you his number and he can look for those stuff oh, for you. Oh, that, that sounds exciting. I'll have to try yeah. to return to that project when time permits. Anyway, it's, it's, it's installed out. I won't go into the detail of that. <laughs> Curious also to your laptops. You said you guys install them with Windows. Have you had any success or requests from the schools to convert them to sort of, I think it's called cloud ready, neverware. It's like a Google uh, OS. Oh, just curious. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know about that. But again, like I said, I'm not the IT person. I can manage IT people. Don't ask me to fix your computer. <laughs> No, yeah, but that's so that's really cool. So there's a lot at your store. Is there anything else at your store that people should know about? You mentioned the computers, you mentioned that people can get parts. I mean, maybe there's other stuff out there that people want to know. And then there is a bit of a question about parking lot depots. I think Daniel Mack. Uh, yeah. So I mean, those are two questions. Tell people more about what they might find in your store. I mean, you mentioned some of it, but I'm sure there's parts we've missed. And then maybe you talk about yeah. the parking. Sure. Um, so in our store, it's the primary focus of our store is refurbished computers. So primarily towers and monitors. Uh, we do get laptops. We have lots of parts. Um, and then we do get other things as well. So big stereo systems. Sometimes we get TVs that we can refurbish and sell. Um, again, it's really at the whim of what comes in for recycling. Um, you can always like I said, you can call and let us know what you're looking for and we can call you and let you know if it comes in. You can stop by anytime. Uh, when we do get really cool, neat stuff, a lot of the time it does go up on our social media and as well as on Kijiji. Jeff has a really big following on Kijiji, so you can always uh, search Mother Earth Recycling on the Kijiji Winnipeg website and see what we have there. Uh, we also have a lot of things like CDs, DVDs, things like that. As they come in, we put them out on the shelves for people. Um, and then if they don't sell after a while, we just donate them to different organizations or secondhand stores in the city. Um, 
Yes, and so those parking lot depots. So we do a lot of uh, partnerships with community groups. So the Daniel Mac, I can't remember the whole what the acronym stands for there. The Daniel Mac Neighborhood Association. So that is in two weeks, I believe. Yes, October 30th. Uh, they're doing a community cleanup. So you can take your electronics and your mattresses to their building on Ellis and they're collecting everything. And then uh, we come and we pick it all up and we bring it back to our facility to be recycled. So we work with a few different organizations like that uh, doing community cleanups. So again, if your neighborhood wants to do it, if you're on a board of a community center or you just want to get involved in your community as well as recycling some way, by all means, give us a call and we will come drop off all the bins for you and help you with posters and stuff like that. And then we will come pick it all up for you. Um, and generally when we do those, we don't charge for the pickup like we do with uh, regular pickups. And I guess I should add, I talked about pickups for now. Um, we do offer pickup services uh, for businesses and residential pickups. Uh, residential pickups are $50. So if you are wanting to get rid of a computer or really anything that we accept, it's $50 for us to come out. It doesn't matter on the volume. And then same for businesses, it's $85. And that could be for one box of electronics or an entire five ton truck full of electronics. It's $85 for businesses, uh, regardless of the volume. Um, and we generally operate within the city limits, um, but we definitely have been known to go out to places like Selkirk and Steinbach and things like that uh, to do large pickups. So we just have to charge an extra fee for that driving time. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you guys take used ink cartridges? No, so we used to, um, but all ink, cartridge, ink cartridges need to go through, um, uh, is it Cascade? No, Miller Environmental, I believe, is where you need to take your toner cartridges. Yes, Miller Environmental, sorry, I had to think about that for a minute. But yeah, uh, those go to Miller Environmental. Um, if they come to us, uh, we can send them there as well, but then we have to pay for that. So we would have to pass that fee on to the customer. And yes, thank you for sharing. It's the Daniel Mack St. Matthews Community Association there. And that's, I'll comment in there, that's on October 30th is their community cleanup. And I believe we're also doing one the weekend before out in the St. James area, um, but we'll share that on social media once they put their poster up as well. Yes, I just checked our schedule. Yes, it's October 30th at Daniel Mac, and then out in St. James on the 23rd, the weekend before. think i think we're getting to the end of the questions jessica i really thank you for giving us your time this morning i'm sure you want to get back to your kids and your husband and uh, enjoy your saturday that way but um thank you so much i i really found it uh interesting oh how much how much is one of those precious plastic machines out of curiosity like um, I did some research and uh, what was it now to build all three of the machines that we needed. It was around, I want to say $25,000. So it's mm -hmm. still a fairly big chunk of money that we would need to save up to be able to do that. Um, and also finding someone to build them. I don't know how to build them. <laughs> so we would need to find someone that's able to build those for us uh, in the city. Uh, but it's definitely something that is really on my radar and something that I really want to start seeing going. Um, it's something that even outside of Mother Earth Recycling, I've been thinking about like, if I had a garage, <laughs> I would be trying to do this out of my garage. And there is somebody actually in Winnipeg. Um, uh, I think it's just called Winnipeg Recycling. Um, it's a guy running it out of his garage and you can, at Pollux Hardware, you can get the plastic bags, you pay for the bag. 
and it's like the liners for chip bags and things like that and you save them up and he'll come collect that from you and he turns it into I believe just like planter boxes and things like that but it's just a really small operation out of somebody's garage so it's really an extension of something like that we're just trying to make it a bigger scale um, and products that are a little bit more accessible so we don't want to take these plastics and turn them into something huge and giant um, we, like, we don't want to make park benches because not everyone needs a park bench but everyone can use pot plant plants for pots right like especially during COVID I don't know about you at the start of COVID I had no plants I now have about 25 plants in my house <laughs> so I see like that's something that everyone uh, could be using um, or like backsplash tiles um, in houses and stuff like that so one of the social enterprises next door to us uh, they do retrofits and things like that in Manitoba housing so we're trying to think of ways that we could maybe partner with them. If we can make tiles that could go into Manitoba housing. So it's recycled tiles made by people with barriers being installed by people who have barriers through a company that's a social enterprise and trying to make all those linkages. Um, so we're always kind of looking at what those next things might be. Wow, that's really interesting. I'm sure we could keep going on and we maybe should, but I think at some point we'll we'll close it off. Uh, we usually do <laughs> about good. an hour and you generously gave two hours of your time. So just, um, but yeah, uh, thank you everyone. Um, maybe once again, I don't know if you, you might want to share your screen with your information there at the end of the cutoff, just if people want to get all of your contact information again at uh, your address and stuff. So we'll leave that there for people so they can see that and uh, I, I got to book a tour. I'm going to maybe follow up with Billy and book a tour. We'll come to a walkthrough because I would love to see uh, your facility. So as, as we discussed, I'll bring the tobacco and maybe buy with a tour to uh, see. Yeah. That would be great. I really yeah, it. we are, like I said, like we've stayed open this whole time during COVID. At the start, we obviously had no idea what was going to happen. And luckily, we stayed busy and got busier. And we've actually expanded our warehouse into more space. Um, but anybody can stop in. Uh, anybody that does want to see the facility and what we do, we just ask that uh, preferably you be fully vaccinated. Our staff is entirely fully vaccinated. Um, so that was really important to us. Uh, but also just wearing a mask, sanitizing, socially distancing, things like that uh, for our staff safety and for your own safety if you come by. Um, but like I said, we're very open about what we do. If anybody wants to come by, see what we do, ask questions, we'd be happy to have them in. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. I really appreciate it. Oh, oh, here we go. So now we get to see last minute questions. Do you have time to mentor young Indigenous women on how to set up enterprises? No, <laughs> I wish I did. I would love to be able to do that. Um, that is um, like there's a uh, futurepreneur has an Indigenous section to it um, and they do a lot of that kind of work. So uh, Futurepreneur would be a really great uh, resource for anyone Indigenous or otherwise, uh, but they do have a specific Indigenous um, social enterprise setup um, portion of what they do. Um, but it is also just kind of the broader social enterprise sector that we want to start working more on this kind of thing. Um, but social enterprises in general really don't have a ton of resources available to us. We're providing resources to our people, uh, but then the people running those organizations don't always have a lot of resources for themselves. Um, but it is something that we uh, should probably work a little bit harder on doing for the community. Thank you again so much. Can't thank you enough, Jessica. No problem. It was great to be here and it was great to reconnect with you, James. Yeah, it was. It was really good. Well, we'll, we'll make sure I'll be, I'm going to be by there in the next little bit to do a tour. So I look forward to that. And Sounds good. Week.